right, part C now has a series of questions, a group of about five questions on average, that are grouped together by topic. And each group focuses on a topic and the questions follow after the other. Most often you're going to have to solve for the answer for, one, for the first question and carry that answer over. Now you're thinking, what if I get the first question wrong, it gets the rest of it wrong. But that doesn't mean you lose out on all those points. You actually only lose out points on that first one, and you could still get the max number of points for the rest of the questions so long as you do everything correctly. Because that shows the graders that you know what you're supposed to do. You might have made some silly little mistake in the first question or so. All right, so they have to follow what you're doing step by step. And enough of my chatter, let's actually get into part C. And so we start with a skier going up an incline, um, it's exerting a force up over a distance. So number 66 is definitely asking for the work done by the skier. Okay. And, oh, I forgot to change the colors of my pens. Let me quickly change to my usual colors. Sorry, just taking a moment. Okay, I'm ready. All right, so we start with purple. Number 66, we're determining the work done by the skier. So work is force times distance. Now we have to figure out what exactly these variables are coming from. Okay, so you need to read the actual paragraph. There's some key things. So the mass of the skier is 72 kilograms. The height is 40 meters. The force exerted is 158 newtons. So that's our force. And the distance where the force is exerted is 230 meters. Do, do not confuse the 40 meters because the force is being exerted along the incline. So you have to use the same distance in the same direction. That's when work is being done, guys. So our distance is 230 meters. And so you multiply them together and you should get Oops, I need to calculate this out. You should get um, approximately 36,300 joules. Just about. I'm just looking off the answer key. I'm not really calculating myself. To calculate it, you should actually get just about the same answer. Oh, it's just about. Okay. Now, numbers 67 to 68, which means you got to show work. Okay. 66 didn't require you to show work. You could have just calculated yourself, write the answer, and that's it. Now, this next section, this next question, you have to show the work. So we're going to calculate the gravitational potential energy, PE equals MGH. That's the only equation you're going to use to calculate it. So we need to calculate the, using the mass of the skier, 72 kilograms, times G, which is 9.81 meters per second squared, and the height is 40 meters. You need all three quantities and their units. So this here is the first point for 67. The second point, which is number 68, you gotta make sure you calculate it correctly. And you get 28,252.8 joules, okay? You write that, that's another point. Number 69. Describe what happens to the internal energy. Okay, so internal energy we kind of associate with friction and heat. And sometimes sound. So we should think. Work, as I mentioned before, is the total energy the skier is exerting. So it has all this work, it's doing all this work, and is exerting energy. Part of this total energy is then becoming potential energy, 28,000 of it. So you have your total, which is the work. Part of it's becoming p potential energy of 28K. So this is 36K, 28K which means part of it has to go somewhere, and that's internal energy. So whatever's left over. Now you're thinking, what about kinetic energy? The person's moving, but is the kinetic energy changing as he's going up the hill? No, that's why you gotta read. 
the person is moving at constant speed. That means kinetic energy is not changing. Yes, some of it's de being devoted to kinetic energy, but as the person's moving up the hill, kinetic energy is not changing, which means internal energy is being expended there. Some of the work is being expended as internal energy. So then this means the internal energy increases. As you go up the hill, person increases in potential energy and internal energy, He's expending some energy as heat. All right, number 70. What happens to the total mechanical energy? So that's kinetic energy and potential energy. Since the person's going up the hill, potential energy clearly increases. So if that increases, what about kinetic energy? Kinetic energy is constant. So overall, this increases. Okay, here we have a parallel circuit because there are branches here. So this is a parallel circuit because it's important for us to know which equivalent resistance equation we're going to calculate for. So this is in a parallel circuit. You look at the reference table, the resi equivalent resistance in a parallel circuit is shown as this. Okay. So 1 over 15 ohms plus 1 over 30 ohms. You calculate that. Okay, you get 3 over 30. Don't forget to flip it. 10 ohms. Okay? And that is your final answer for 71 to 72. You show the equation, substitution with units, and your final answer with units, and that's 71 to 72. Number 73, we need to determine the current measured by the ammeter. All right, now we got our total voltage as 60 volts. We don't know our total current in the ammeter because it's outside the branches and right by the battery. So this gives us the total current. But our equivalent resistance, which goes for the overall circuit in the same lieu of the things, is 10 ohms. So we can use for number 73, V equals IR. Total voltage in the battery, equivalent resistance, and total current all go together for V equals IR. 60 volts equals I times 10 ohms. I is 6 amps. Okay. Number 74 to 75, we need to calculate the rate at which the battery supplies energy. This is power. Any rate of energy is power. Okay, so 74 to 75. Got to calculate power. Voltage they give us is 60 volts. And the current is 6 amps. So this is an example where answers have to follow up one after the other. If you get number 71 to 72 wrong, but you do everything else correctly, then you can still get all those points. Just minus the one point from 71 to 72. All right. And so you could do this in a number of ways, but I like to use P equals IV because it's simpler. So 6 amps times 60 volts. And you should get 360 watts as your answer. Now, number 76. If another resistor were added in parallel, so let's say hypothetically we add another one like that, what effect would this have on the current through resistor 1? So what is happening over here? Well, we should know in a parallel circuit, the, they do not share currents. The resistors in each branch don't share anything with each other. They're independent. So whatever is happening here is not going to affect what's going on over here. It'll increase the overall current of the circuit, but it's not going to change anything in the other two branches. They still go about their usual business. Okay? So nothing will happen. Nothing changes.
because their currents are independent of each other. All right. You just add another pathway for the overall circuit, but the same current will still flow through that other R1 branch. Okay. All right, 77 to 80 is just two um, sets of two-point questions. 77 to 78 wants to calculate kinetic energy with that equation of the moving airplane. Kinetic energy is equal to one-half. Mass is 2.5 kilograms. The velocity... 18 meters per second. And don't forget to square it. The answer will be 405 joules, and that's two points. Number 79 to 80. We need to calculate the magnitude of the centripetal force. Centripetal force, you could obtain that as MAC or MV squared over R. Okay, so we're going to use mv squared over r. Our mass is 2.5 kilograms. The speed is still 18 meters per second. We have to square that. And we have to put over the radius of the circle, 25 meters. Okay, so the centripetal force, you multiply and divide, plug and chug, and you get... 32.4 newtons as your answer. And don't forget that force is in newtons. That's a unit. And there we go up to 80. And finally, the last set of questions here, 81 to 85. This is an interesting example of refraction, given that we usually don't see a refracted ray at 90 degrees. But anyhow, here let's look at this piece of information. The angle of refraction is 90 degrees, that's important, so this angle is 90 degrees. Okay, number 81 to 82, we need to calculate the wavelength of the light ray in air. Okay, so the speed of light, here's something important to know or remember, speed of light in air is almost equivalent to speed of light in a vacuum, okay? So that means we could use 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second as our speed. And they gave us the frequency, so that means for 81 to 82, we're going to use V equals F lambda. So 3E8 meters per second equals 5.09 E14 hertz times lambda. Lambda is then equal to 5.89 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Okay, It's okay to use the E notation that's allowed on the regions. It also is definitely a much quicker shorthand for a lot of these exponents and powers of 10. But that's our wavelength for number 81 to 82. Number 83, we need to measure the angle of incidence for the light ray. Ooh, that means we need to use a protractor. Let me whip that out in a moment. All right, now here's the protractor, and I aligned it almost just perfectly. This is an example of the protractors you're going to use on the test, at least in our school. And so keep in mind, remember, you got to make sure you get this. This is the cross of reference. You're going to make sure you measure this angle from the normal line. You see this dashed line in the middle? That's your normal line, so that's where you need to measure those angles from the normal. So it's not the usual from the horizontal where our interface is, it's from the normal. Okay, so that angle is about 50 degrees. Okay, so we're going to put down our answer as about 50 degrees, as you can see. Um, make sure that you get about there. You are allowed to be above and below by 2 degrees. So anywhere from 48 to 52 is acceptable, according to the answer key. Now, we got to calculate the absolute index of refraction for medium X. 
So we gotta follow where this light ray is going. It starts in medium X, and then it goes into air. Okay, so we're gonna use Snell's law of refraction. The index of refraction for X is what we're looking for, N1. And the incident angle where it started out in was 50 degrees. N2 is air, and that you can look up on the reference table is 1.00. Sine of the refracted angle, and that is 90 degrees. Get that N1 is equal to, basically, 1 divided by sine 50 degrees. Put that is equivalent to 1.3, 1 as your answer or 1.3 and that's it and that is the end of the physics regions oh wait last thing before I even call this off keep in mind you never know who's gonna be grading you but when you have angles you gotta make sure that degree symbols there as your unit some people think it's a unit some people don't you never know who's gonna grade you make sure you have that degree symbol for the angle that's your unit and now we're done all 85 questions, not really 85 questions, but 85 points total to be accumulated. This region's had a passing score of 48 out of 85. And that's about, mm, not, that's not even near 65%, to be honest. 48 divided by 85, that's about 56%, 57%. So you don't need all 65% to pass to get the 65. You just need about 56%. That means a healthy balance of multiple choice and free response. My advice, definitely do not skip those free response questions, especially for some of you that are very scared of those questions. Don't forget units and everything. Um, yeah, so make sure you're well prepared for this test. Just do a bunch of practice, you know, guys. That's all it is. Take care.